machine to thread wood for a mason jar because you can probably see that the mason jar lid and in I get it. In mason jar parlance, this is called the lid. The flat portion is called the lid. This is called the ring. So when we talk about the lid and the ring, we're talking about two different things. But the reason you're not going to have to build a machine, Dick, Dick and Mike, is because we glue the ring into the wood so that you can screw it onto the mason jar. Now, mason jars come in all different sizes and shapes. For instance, this uses the very same lid that this quart mason jar lid, uh, uses. And this is a pint. It uses the very same lid. However, there are different size mason jars that use a different size lid. We're just going to be talking about this particular uh, lid or, or ring, which is two and seven eighths inch in diameter. Now, I think the other size that the mason jar uh, lid is is like three and a half. So it's a little bit bigger. Uh, sometimes, some of you have seen the jar that looks kind of like a jam jar. It's straight, kind of straight up and down. It has a much larger ring. We're just going to be talking about the two and seven eighths inch lid or ring that fits in the in the wood, Pennsylvania. But he demonstrates all over. And he said that he started demonstrating these lids. He said, I've never sold one unless I was forced to sell it by my wife. But he said he would go places and demonstrate making these lids. And he'd have a, a line of lids that had been completed there. And ladies would come by and look at it and say, well, how much is that one? He said, well, I'm, I don't sell them. I just demonstrate. And he said, she would say, well, I like that one. How much is it? I want it. And he said, he learned fairly quickly that ladies love decorative De uh, decorative mason jar lids and that's one of the reasons that I decided to do this demonstration today is because it's getting that time of the year that you need Christmas gifts and it's fairly easy to do this little project now I also want to say that you can design the lid however you want to design it Here's one that has no top knot or no uh, pinnacle at all. It's just flat. If you want to do that and put decorative rings around it or whatever, that's up to you. Or you can make one that has a, a decorative pull on the top of it that you can hold on to. Or there are just all kinds of things that you can do. You can make the lid almost of any composition you want to. Uh, this is half inch birch plywood glued together to, uh, to turn. Uh, here's an example of a segmented piece that I just hap happened to have laying around in the shop and I thought oh that would that would be alright to make a decorative mason jar lid 
this particular one is some more of that wood that I just had uh, off fall that I had laying in the shop and said, well, that would make a, a nice looking piece. So, whatever you want to do, your imagination is the only limiting factor. And what you do with the top of it, what kind of finial you put on it or spindle or what if you want to leave it blank or how you want to decorate it, that's just up to you. It's not a, the only limiting factor there is like I say, your imagination. Okay, now to, to begin, let's talk about, if you look at the handout, if you have a handout and look at it, uh, we, we start off saying that we have to prepare the turning blank. Well, obviously, we know that that's the case. If we're going to turn wood, we're going to have to have a turning blank. So, how you prepare the turning blank kind of depends upon what you want to do with the wood. If you want to have a segmented piece that you're turning, then it's going to be different than if you have a solid, solid piece that you're uh, you want to turn. For instance, we started by showing a picture there of a solid piece. It must, it, it needs to be a minimum, a minimum of four inches in diameter. <clears throat> okay, here's an example of a piece that could be a solid piece four inches in diameter. Now the reason for that is because when you turn it down into the shape for your uh, mason jar lid and put the ring inside, you, you need to have a little surface on all the way around for the ring to fit into. If you use four inches a four inch diameter piece then that's going to give you an inch and one eighth total so that's going to be uh, nine sixteenths on each side uh, when you cut the ring into the bottom so that gives you some a little bit of space there to work with so it needs to be four inches in diameter across and the, the way you determine how large a blank you need you need to have a minimum of one inch for your base because you're going to go five, eight, five eighths of an inch deep or a minimum of five eighths of an inch deep into the into the wood for your to glue in the ring and then you're going to have to decide, well, what do, what do I want the finial to look like? In other words, is it going to be tall or is it going to be short and squatty? What, and once you decide that, then you add another inch onto that distance so that you can chuck it up. And what I did with this particular blank, I just cut a, cut a groove around it, square before. Segmented blank, regardless of how it's segmented, then you're going to have to do the same thing. You need one inch thickness for your base, plus the amount that you're going to need for your handle or for your finial, spindle, whatever you want to call that, then plus the ability to chuck it into the lathe. So that will determine for you what size blank you need and uh, from that point you uh, then move on. Now, there are many, many, many different ways that you can do this. I like to use a four jaw chuck and chuck the blank into the four jaw chuck. 
if you needed to use a face plate or other things to do this, you could do it. You just need to recognize that if you use a face plate and are going to have to screw into the wood, then you're going to have to allow for that in your blank that you're preparing. But that's, that's not a big problem. There are lots of different ways you could do this. It's just handy to do it with a four jaw chuck. Then you can just chuck it off and, and turn your piece and uh, part it off of the lathe and, and you've got what you want. So that's how you determine the size on your blank. Uh, on on the like, on this particular one, uh, am I in the picture? Yes, yes perfect. Uh, okay. On this particular one, I I put a put some uh, <laughs> laminations in between to decorate it, and one on top before I put the spindle in uh, that I was going to glue in, so that just just to decorate it. But you can do whatever you want to with that. Okay, now if you're going to do a laminated uh, blank, you use the same guidelines, same principles that you use on the solid blank. You just have to know how high the spindle needs to be and all of that information and then you need to uh, make that length according Okay, on the segmented, the base needs to be one inch thick, four inches in diameter. That gives you plenty of wood to work with there. Okay, then if you're going to do a segmented where you use another piece of wood, for instance, this one I use uh, birch, just a one inch thickness of birch and put a, just put a little lamination between it for decorative pur uh, purposes and then some mesquite burl for the top. Yeah, I just made sure that I'm, I've got enough space here to turn the wood like I want it and part it off and have the size uh, jar lid that I want. So you use the same principle, but when you laminate them, put them together, there are some guidelines that you need to think about. If you look on the second page, turn a dowel, a one inch dowel on the end of the spindle to match the hole drilled in the center of this piece, and I said I already said on the first page, drill a hole through there. It doesn't have to be a one-inch hole. I just chose that. You could drill a, a smaller hole or a larger hole if you wanted to to make your dowel. But the purpose of the dowel, and Ron Butler emphasized this in his video, the purpose of the dowel, particularly if you're going to use if you're going to use a drill to hollow out the base of your of your turning it re, it produces a lot of torque on that turning so you need a gluing surface there that will provide the that amount of surface so that when, you're, when you've got your forstner bit pushed into the, the turning itself, that it's not going to produce so much uh, torque that it will break the, the spindle. And so that's the reason he recommended using the dowel and gluing it then into your base in, in this situation so that our in this situation, you can see that the dowel is in, inside and I've glued it in 
And now I've got the turning ready to put into the four jaw chucks. That's the reason for the dowel itself going down into your uh, base. Okay. Now the next thing that we need to do, we're ready now. I've already done all that and prepared this turning blank that we're going to put into the four jaw chuck. And we are going to use the fastener bit. However, the question comes up, do I have to have a fastener bit? The fastener bit is a two and seven eighths inch fastener bit. Well, not too many of us keep that size in our shop normally. I ordered one and I paid $24.99 for it. Uh, it's not, they're not really, uh, I think, I think I got mine from a ML, MILS or MIL something. Uh, anyway, they, I've ordered some bits from them before. But you can just just plug in two and seven eighths inch Forstner bit on Google, and it'll bring up several different sources that you can order them if you want to order one. Uh, but I I went ahead and and prepared this blank for the two and seven eighths inch Forstner bit. Now. <coughs> The question comes, do I have to have a Forstner bit to do it? No. You can, if, you, if you're just going to make one or two of these for Christmas presents, I wouldn't advise spending that kind of money unless you've got more money than you do cents. But I wouldn't advise doing that. If you're going to make a hundred of them for Christmas gifts, then it might be worth it to you to do that. But you can see if, if you look at this blank, I have already turned out quite a portion down to five-eighths of an inch in depth. And that's how deep you have to, to turn the hole in order to put the ring inside. Five-eighths of an inch. So I've I already hauled out some of that material. And I'm going, when I put this in the, on the lathe and use the Forstner bit, it's going to be a little bit easier for it to cut down into that than it would if it was having to take the entire diameter of that two and seven-eighths inch out. But you don't have to have a Forstner bit. You can do it with a, with a chisel. I used the badan to uh, to get to take this out, but you, there are all kinds of of tools that you can use to to do that, and you don't have to have the Forstner bit. Chuck this up. I got that in pretty close to the way I've had it before and it's running fairly true. So uh, you, you have to be careful of that. Another thing that you have to be careful of when you chuck 
your Forstner bit, you need before you before you put your chuck, your four jaw chuck on the on the the uh, spindle, you need to make sure and line up the point of the Forstner bit with the put a put a point inside your drive and make sure that you line those up. As, as large as this is, sometimes if you're not careful in lining that up, you may get a little variation there and you don't want that because that's going to cause vibration when you start drilling. And so you want to line that point. I have already done this, so I, I know it's fairly true right now. But you want to line the point with the point on your drive so that it's, it's very close. marked five-eighths of an inch on the Forstner bit so that I know the approximate depth that is the correct depth. Okay, now a thing that you have to be aware of, on the mason jar <coughs> jars themselves, there's the thread and then there's a stop ring on the jars themselves. If, if you drill too deep into your, into your uh, workpiece that it will go down so far that it hits this stop ring and it won't tighten up. So that's a thing that you have to be aware of. It's not really a problem because there's about an eighth of an inch. If you put your ring into your turning You've got about a, a flush with the bottom of your of your uh, decorative turning. You've got about an eighth of an inch to work with in there, so it's not a a real problem. You just won't don't want to drill so deeply that it causes you to stop on this ring on the jar. And I think all all of the mason jars have that ring. You can see it here even on this little tiny small one. Okay. Now you can see that's a little quicker than hogging the entire circle out with lathe tools. Uh, a, a little quicker, but if you're not going to turn very many of these lids, it might not be worth spending that money for a, a Forstner bit this size. Okay, I want to check this. Check this with the ring and see if we're in pretty good shape. Well, I went about a sixteenth of an inch deeper than I would have to to make it flush. But that's okay. We'll try it, we'll try it and see. Make sure that it doesn't bottom out on the stop ring. Okay. I've, I'm in good shape. I've got plenty of, plenty of room here. When we glue the ring, the mason jar ring, into the workpiece, then it's gonna, I'm going to have plenty of space there and it's not going to hit the stop ring on the mason jar. 
Okay. And you also would have your lid too to give you a little bit more. The the lid, yeah, doesn't take up very much space. It it clamps down on. It has a it has a, a, a rubber seal on it that clamps down onto the jar. So we're not we're not talking about too many thousands there. Well, Larry, if you were too deep, you'd want to just face that a little. And well, yeah, just take some off of this edge to get it to the point that it, your jar would go down tight on that. Okay. I'm going to get rid of this. I don't have one that big in my house. How big is yours? About two Okay, any questions so far? I've got questions. Okay. And could you make that a little bit smaller and twist the, uh, the, the lid, the wing inside, to make it a tighter fit to gluing the, uh, the wing into the lid? I'm not saying you couldn't do that. You could. It would take a lot of time and effort to make that so tight that you press the ring into it. Plus the fact, here's another consideration you'd have to have. This outside portion of the ring, I don't know if you can see it, the outside portion of the ring is a tiny bit larger than the internal diameter so in order to get it just the right size for this ring to press down in there and stay without gluing it might be a pretty good pretty good problem I'll, I'll tell you now there are several different glues you could use uh, Ron Butler recommended this particular glue it's called Aline's Original Tacky Glue. It's used by seamstress uh, in sewing. Yeah, and it dries perfectly clear, and it is a little bit gap filling also. So when you put the ring of this particular glue into your wood, it seals pretty good and holds and then dries perfectly clear without any problem. I, I got this for 327 at Hobby Lobby. Uh, and, and it's a, a good strong glue that's plenty strong for the needs of, of this. You can also use a silicon, silicon sealer if you want to. It takes a little longer to dry, but it dries clear and and uh, you could use that. So there, there are many different glues you could use for this process. Yeah, that's true. And both silicon and uh, this tacky glue is flexible, pliable. It could move also. Now, other question. Yes. Larry, he has a question about press fitting the ring in there. One thing you have to consider about that also, when that wood starts moving, that ring may not move. Yeah, that's what Mike said. Yeah, wood's always moving with uh, t uh, temperature and humidity variations and you get some changes in size, so uh, it, it'd probably be wise to go ahead and glue it. You know, you, you could work hard and maybe fit it right, but uh, it'd be plus the fact that when you screw that lid down, if you want, to, want it to seal really good, you have to put some pressure on it. 
other any other points or questions? Okay. Our next step in this process needs to be roughing out the blank and then turning it to shape. I didn't even bring my my roughing tool, so I'm just going to use a half inch gouge to do this. close to round but what I want to say is if, if you can see this I don't know if you can see this bottom edge if you can see that I've got a little bit over one half inch in there to play with well I don't want the thickness of those walls to be a, a full half inch now a discussion may come up well how thick do you want them uh, Ron Butler recommended in his video about a quarter of an inch. I like that. I don't like to get them too thin because you take a, a, a real chance of, low, of that splitting if you get it down too thin. Uh, about a quarter of an inch is small enough for the lid to look good and yet it still gives you some strength when you shape this and then part it from the from the uh, tool itself from the lathe itself and turn it around and rechuck it on the inside of this it still gives you some strength in there so that it will well, you won't take a chance of it splitting. So I like that quarter of, a, quarter of an inch, but you can do, again, whatever you want to in that respect. If you wanted to thin it down more than that, you could, or make it larger than that. But you can see here that it's about, about 96 feet is what that is. And... Uh, by the time we get through shaping it and sanding it, we'll try to turn it down to a quarter or less. Okay. <coughs> Everything on this lathe is backwards to what my delta is at home. So I'm having to get used to tighten, loosening and tightening on this, but that's okay. <clears throat> now the next step in this process is to shape your, your turning the shape you want it. And again, I want to say that is totally up to you and your imagination. You can shape this however you want. I'm, I'm going to try to shape this particular one something like this. 
so that it, it gives a similar look to this. Okay, now, I have the, the edge here is just a little bit over a quarter of an inch at the highest point here. Uh, the curve toward the, the ring itself is maybe just <laughs> under a quarter of an inch. But that, to me, that's close to the right thickness. That's not critical, again I say, and you can do whatever you want to on that. All right, now I've got to continue to shape the inside of the, of the spindle. And I have in mind what I want to do there, but I've got to shape that down. One thing that I haven't said is this. The reason, the reason I said one inch thickness on this base is because you're going to go five eighths plus a little bit. So if it's one inch thick, then that leaves you close to three eighths of an inch. Well, if I have to go down into the base itself any, you see that's going to get it down there pretty low. So a minimum thickness that you need there is one inch. This gives me, the way, the way I cut this down, this gives me maybe five sixteenths or so that I can, if I need to go down into the base itself to make the shape the shape that I want, 
then I can do that. But the reason you need that one inch thickness is to make sure that you do not cut down into the, the ring itself. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and shape the spindle to close to the shape that I want. And what we're going to do is when I get the spindle and the top knot close to what I want, I'm going to part that off of the lathe and then turn this around and reverse chuck it into the jaws on the inside and then finish the top of the turning so that I get it exactly what I want when I do that. So I'm going to go ahead and start shaping the spindle now. The first thing I'm do is cut the spindle down to approximately the size that I want the top, the top of the top knot here. I'll cut it down to, I don't know exactly what size I want that, but I'll cut it down somewhere close to that. The thing that I have to remember here is that the ring itself is one and uh, is five eighths of an inch deep. So what I do with the top of this, I have to take into consideration that I only have five eighths of an inch to work with. If I cut it too down too far, then I'm going to get into that cut for the ring and it's going to split apart, so I've got to keep that into consideration. I'm going to leave about this size and try to make my top knot, the top of the top knot, approximately this size in diameter. Okay, now, I don't know if you can see here, 
But I, I've done a similar thing right here with this particular piece. It has a, it has a, a veneer decorative piece between the turning and the spindle, just for looks. Okay, I have cut down slightly into, to, to make a concave surface there to work with for the turning itself. You don't have to do that. You can do whatever you want to there. Or you can decorate it some where there's a piece going around that doesn't have a spindle on top of it. Uh, if you want to decorate one like that some way you, you can. Okay. So, I've got it approximately the size. I'm, I know that I've got some room here to work with. I check this, and right now I've got a quarter of an inch. Okay, so I can cut down into the base about an eighth of an inch without running into problems. So I, at first I think I'm going to try that. Cut, cut down a groove down in, a concave surface down in to the base to just make a, a surface on top that I like. Okay, I want to check that and see how close I guessed. So that thickness presently is about one-eighth of an inch. I've got one-eighth of an inch from the top of the groove to the bottom of this cut, which is plenty. That's, that's enough for stability and uh, then I've also cut down and I like the looks of that top. So now I need to shape that spindle. Okay, let's see what we can do with that. any farther I'm going to go ahead and shape the smaller portion of the spindle uh, and get it to looking something like I want it to
I'm going to use a tool that I just ground for myself out of a screwdriver. But it's just uh, a rounded chisel is all it is. But I'm going to use this to try to shape this cut inside here. off a little bit, maybe. good. I'm going to part this from the lathe now and reverse chuck it and finish shaping the top like I want it. a bad shape. When I finish with the top of it, then we'll sand it, and if I had my spray unit here today, I would go ahead and spray it, but I'm not going to do that. And uh, we'll, I'll go ahead and glue the ring in and show you what we're talking about there. going to reverse chuck it there. Now a thing that you need to recognize is that when the jaws are closed, it fits tight against the chuck. Therefore, it's going to run fairly true when I tighten it up. It's going to run fairly true. So I'm going to tighten it up and we'll see. Okay, that's running, that's running fairly true, so now all I have to do is go ahead and shape that top like I want it, 
and uh, we're in business. some 220 over there I think probably uh, 120 and 180 as far as we'll go today but it it will sand it out pretty well In about 40 years of teaching the famous last word of the student is all I have to do is yeah <laughs> that is true all I have left to do is and that's what he said while I got on one yeah Oh, yeah, see, make it look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't got much sanding to do. You notice that he's pretty handy with those tools he's got. Well, you know about that? I have learned so much attending meetings right here at the South Plains Wood Turners. <laughs> from people that it's just unbelievable. So nobody, I think, nobody ever gets where they want to be as far as learning is concerned. We all can continue to learn. amazing to consider that in the early 1800s they contemplated closing the patent office because there wasn't anything left to invent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's a good reason for the commercials. Yep. So they play the commercials. They're good to fix breakfast. Hey, what kind of material do you use to laminate Just veneers. Well, uh, I, I order wood veneers. Yeah. Okay. That, I, that's as far as I'm going to send. Obviously, it needs more sanding, but uh, that will satisfy our needs here. I was thinking a good Christmas gift would be to give the lid and a jar full of uh, candy, candy and then just give that as a present right. to people in the audience. That, that's... Uh, they have these homemade hot chocolate mixes too that you can put right. in. Right. Yeah. Lots of things you can put in the jar to make it uh, 
advantageous, but uh, I think ladies know a whole lot more about that than us women do, uh, than us men do. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You yeah. bet.